start. So chapter 20 and 21. So the first thing that we'll come out with with these two chapters is that these are ultimately a review. These are a review of chapters 18 and 19. So this is one of the reasons why I opted to give you points back is because if you can figure out what's going on with 18 and 19, 20 and 21 are just a repeat. We pretty much do the exact same thing again. Um, we just add a couple more functional rules. Okay? So in 20 and 21, we're doing a nucleophilic addition, which is what we did in 18 and 19, except what we're also going to follow it with is a nucleophile elimination, okay? which we've technically already seen. When we converted the ketone into the amine, we've technically done a nucleophile addition and a nucleophile elimination. Okay? Cardi didn't classify it that way. I'm not quite sure why. Um, I do understand partly why. Because of kind of the functional group you're starting with is ultimately the big answer. So when we're looking at these chapters, typically what we're starting with is still a car... Whoops, not a ring. It's still a carbonyl, except now you're going to have a leaving group connected to it. Okay? And that's the big change. So that this way, when a nucleophile comes in and attacks, we'll still break the pi bond, but then the pi bond reforms, and we kick out a leaving group. Okay? So what I've just written in that far left corner is a horrible mechanism. Because okay? that's showing two different steps. So if we color code this, we've got the nucleophile addition followed by the elimination. Okay, so it's two mechanistic steps that I've drawn into one thing. Okay, why draw it into one thing? The end result is that you're exchanging or doing what is an apparent substitution, nucleophile for leaving group. Or leaving group for nucleophile. What's the English? I don't know. Um. Nucleophile goes on, leaving group goes off. Right? It's that kind of class that we're now talking about. With the ketones, we didn't really have a leaving group, so that didn't really count. We did end with, when we did the nucleophile elimination, we ended with that carbon right here that had a leaving group and our nucleophile attached. That is the tetrahedral intermediate. The tetrahedral intermediate is key to the mechanisms that we'll be talking about. Okay? So that structure is always going to show up. Okay. Is, there, is there a question? Yes. Did you just notice that? There was a long conversation about this in OCHEM 1 when we talked about mechanistic steps. Like, why the hell did you write those words backwards? What's a nucleophile elimination? It's a nucleophile addition. Backwards. Ta-da. Ta okay. That's ultimately what we'll be studying. Okay. Um, the first time we switched to the Cardi textbook, for whatever reason, that class did exceptionally well on exam two. Uh, so well that it shocked and surprised the hell out of me that I decided that we should start the very next unit with a quiz just to see what they could go through and do. Okay, so let's see what you guys can go through and do. We've got five reactions here. Nucleophile addition, followed by an elimination. Okay. You do not have to draw a mechanism to do these. Okay. Or you could draw that shorthand one. Do you want me to do one as a shorthand? Yeah, okay, and we'll talk about it real quickly too. So let's do literally question one. So first, we would need to identify our nucleophile. Okay? Or let's take a step back, our most reactive thing. What's the most reactive thing in one? Okay, so we've got a suggestion for the carbonyl. Any other suggestions? What was that? Okay. We have an oxygen-sodium bond, which is an ionic bond, which means we have a negative oxygen. Anything else jump out at you guys? The 
There's the other pi bond, which I did not see until you mentioned that. And there's that hydrogen. Anybody see how this could get challenging? Yes. Okay. You're responsible for recognizing that all of these things can potentially react. Okay. You're responsible for deciding which of those is the best pairing to go forwards. Okay. This is why when we talk about these reactions, we talk about how we would expect them to react. What should they act like? Okay. So we go all the way back to unit one. How did we describe the reactivity of alkenes? <clears throat> okay. Not reactive. If we forced them to react, they would react as? Nucleophiles. Okay. We've got the carbonyl. How does the carbonyl typically react? As an electrophile. The carbon acts as an electrophile. Okay. And that is its primary category as far as reactivity. The oxygen does have lone pairs, so that oxygen could act as a nucleophile or base. Really, the base is the only one that's particularly useful for us. Okay. What else do we have? We have the hydrogen, okay, which acts as an acid. And in particular, this is a carboxylic acid. Okay. So that is pretty darn acidic, right? Okay. What else do we have? Okay. We have the oxyanion, which is a negative oxygen. And what could that negative oxygen act as? A nucleophile or a base. Or a base. Okay. Negatives become very challenging because they can do both. To differentiate between a nucleophile and a base, what do we need to do? Nucleophiles attack carbons. Nucleophiles attack carbons. Bases attack hydrogens. hydrogens. That's our ultimate differentiator. The problem with that definition right now is what? Both of those are options, and I haven't shown any arrows to say what it's acting as. Okay? In this case, you're being asked to predict what the product is, so you have to decide which is it going to act as, a nucleophile or a base. Okay? So what is our differentiator between nucleophiles and bases? No, both of them are ultimately going to donate electrons. Size. Size. Okay. Typically, nucleophiles need to be small, small so that they can get in to act as a nucleophile. Okay. So if it is small, it's probably a nucleophile. If it is large, does that mean it's a base? Or sorry, if it's large, does that mean it's a base? Yes. Okay. Typically. If it's small, does that mean it's a nucleophile? Fortunately, not. Small can still act as a base. So if we're given the choice of a small nucleophile, which we have, deciding between, or sorry, small anion, should we decide nucleophile or base? It's a general trend when in doubt, favor the base. Bases are easier to react, okay? To act as a base, it is sharing electrons with hydrogen. hydrogen. And where are hydrogens located? Yeah, on acids, less specifically. <laughs> less specific. Where are hydrogens? Almost everywhere. Outside the structure. Okay. Hydrogens tend to be everywhere on the outside, which means the very first thing that, that negative charge is going to encounter is probably going to be hydrogen. a hydrogen. So is that hydrogen acidic? To decide that, it needs to be a polar bond. And this is where we've talked through kind of those differences in electronegativity. Hydrogen bonded to carbon, not very acidic. Hydrogen bonded to nitrogen, not very acidic. Hydrogen bonded to oxygen, yeah, now we're starting to get into a range that's usable. Okay? Of course, there's exceptions to those general trends. Those exceptions largely involving things like resonance, induction, and all those other things. Okay? So we've now outlined all of the things that this could possibly do. 
So we now want to think about this with curved arrows. What do we think would be the most likely thing to have happen? Call off the high chain. Okay. Draw an arrow from, uh, from the OH bond to the oxygen, and then from the oxygen that's negative to the H. <coughs> and what did you suggest, Alex? So both of those explanations work, okay? They're all referencing slightly different things. Alex decided to focus that we have a negative base, and that's the most reactive thing. When David talked through his analysis, he said, show the arrow where the bond is breaking between the hydrogen and the oxygen. So in my mind, David focused on that hydrogen being acidic. Alex focused on the oxygen being negative. Who is more correct? They're about the same, okay, particularly because that's the arrow sequence that we're showing. I would argue zeroing in on that negative is a better option because... It's more reactive. It's more reactive because... Charged. It's charged. Okay? So it's not that David is wrong, because he's right. That is acidic. Okay? But trying to find the patterns where we're evaluating charge before we start digging into other things. Does that make sense? Right? And yes, absolutely, that is exactly what happens in this case. But that would be this is an acid base reaction, right? And what did we say this chapter was? Elimination. Nucleophile addition and nucleophile elimination. Just because it's nucleophile addition and elimination doesn't mean the other reactions all of a sudden disappear. We still have to remember them and keep them at the back of our mind. Because if we try to do this as a nucleophile addition, where does that negative need to attack? It would need to attack the positive carbon, break the carbonyl, then what happens? We reform and we eject OH. So if we did a nucleophile addition elimination, the result is this. Everybody see that? Okay. Is that the most likely thing to happen? No. How do we know that? Because we've identified all of the chemistries to the rest of the molecules and we zeroed in on the most reactive thing, not what do I want to do. Does that make sense? Okay. That's a very kind of balancing thing to do. Ideally... Going through and targeting the most reactive thing is the most important thing for you guys to be doing. When it comes to the exam, do you need to be considering all of that? Yes. It's a blend. Why is it going to be a blend? What is the majority of your exam? Multiple choice. Multiple choice. So what you could quickly do is scan the multiple choice answers and be like, is there an answer where it just did an acid-base reaction? Yeah, now you're going to have to evaluate, does it do acid-base or nucleophile additional elimination? If it only does the shows nucleophile additional elimination, then what should you do? Do the nucleophile additional elimination. Does that make sense? Right? Was this one given as a format of multiple choice? No, which means what do you have to do? You have to evaluate your whole process and recognize that the product for that very first one is not the nucleophile addition elimination, but instead just an acid base reaction. Okay, make sense? You guys want the nucleophile addition elimination curved arrows on that first one, even though they are wrong, to help you try and reason your way through the others? Yes. Yes. So if it did a nucleophile addition elimination, the negative attacks, we break the pi bond, we reform the pi bond, we eject the leaving group. Okay? That is not the red product. What do you have as a question on them? Do you have a question? No? You sure? 
Okay. Spend some time. You've got two, three, four, five. See what you can come up with. Take a look at five. So five's actually got a couple things going on with it. So if we go through and take a look at what they've got as answers in the blue box. Try to attempt to draw this real quickly. So when you go home, you can review it. NH nitrogen. So, whoops, I wanted to box that one. Dang it. This box, <laughs> okay, that isn't boxed. That is an answer. So what they went through and did is they added the hydride to that carbonyl as opposed to the other carbonyl. Okay, there are two carbonyls. Lithium aluminum hydride is a super reactive hydride that reacts in particular with... Not quite. Polar pi bonds. Okay, that's what it reacts with. So if we think back to when we saw lithium aluminum hydride, we only saw it appear when we had carbonyls. So it reacts specifically with polar pi bonds. If we take a look at these two polar pi bonds, which one is more reactive? The one on the left-hand side is more reactive than the one on the right-hand side. Okay? Which was kind of fun because we actually had two groups shout out answers, or three people shout out answers. Two people said the one on the right, one person said the one on the left. Okay? Nearly the majority of people will say the one on the right is the more reactive one. No. The reason they'll say the one on the right is the most reactive is because nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon and it will thereby withdraw electrons. That's true. That is an inductive effect explanation. Where's the inductive effect in our explanation list? The very bottom. What else does the nitrogen have that is different than the carbon? The lone pair electrons. What will those lone pair electrons do? they will donate into the carbonyl, making that carbon less positive than the other carbonyl, making the leftmost carbonyl more susceptible to the nucleophilic addition. Yes? Okay. And that's tricky. It shows up again and again and again. Okay. This is probably the third or fourth time we've actually talked about it in class. Never mind have been tested on it or in homework. Okay. It's an easy mistake to make. Watch out for the resonance effects. Okay. So if we do that, we just add the hydride from our lithium aluminum hydride. And we'd follow that up with the H plus on that OH. Okay. We say, well, there it is. To Milana's point, no nucleophile addition with elimination. It was just a nucleophile addition. Excess. Lithium aluminum hydride is a very strong hydride nucleophile, meaning it will react with the second polar pi. It'll also react with the other one. Okay? When it reacts with that one, that's the structure I've got boxed up here. Uh, what do you guys think? Because you guys will potentially be going back and rewatching this. Is it okay for me to draw on top of this, erase and draw, or should I draw a new structure? I heard a new structure. It's okay. I may not like it, but that's fine. I don't have to like it, right? You don't have to like my exams. I don't have to like your suggestions of making me draw new stuff. <laughs> Fair trade, right? <laughs> There's our oxygen. So our hydride, sorry, because I find quite the wrong structure, from our lithium aluminum hydride comes in, we'd again protonate OH down there. Everybody okay? Yep. Okay. What we have right now in that carbon is our tetrahedral intermediate. Okay. That tetrahedral intermediate shows up again and again and again, and it's already showed up with our nitrogen and oxygen on our structures. That sp3 carbon now has two very electronegative elements attached to it. It's becoming very positive. Positive enough that what does it want to do? <clears throat> Steal, electrons. 
steal electrons. Where's the easiest place for it to steal electrons from? Within the structure resonance, we have either the nitrogen or the oxygen. Where should it steal electrons from preferentially? Nitrogen. The nitrogen because less. Less the nitrogen is less electronegative. The electrons come back down, and we would eject hydroxide. Whoops, it's about to draw the carbonyl. Mm. Remember, we've already, technically it's not protonated. God. Where am I? And then we'd have OH minus. Is OH minus a good leaving group? No. No, no but what's it leaving into a solution of? H plus. Not H plus. H minus. H minus. Okay. Is OH minus better than H minus? Yes. yes, so that's fair game. Okay, this is what they did. Fantastic. Uh, here. That's awesome. What did you just make, though? A polar pi bond. And what does lithium aluminum hydride react with? Polar pi bonds. Okay, which means the structure reacts again. That five is going to get in the way. Crap, where are we? And of course, drawing it blue was an awful idea. Here's our new hydrogen. There's the old hydrogen. You'd have an extra lone pair with a negative charge. Yeah? So the hydride attacks again. Do we have a polar pi bond anymore? No, which means there's nothing for lithium aluminum hydride to react with. Reaction stops. That's where our H plus comes in. We've been drawing the hydrogens on each of our species, the positive hydrogens, as we went through. Really, they would all come in now at the very end. We would not end with the NH as the hydrogen or the freaking five starts to creep back into the image. And we'd have our NH2. Whoops. Not NH2. NH. With our methyl. Unfortunately, we're under acidic conditions. Nitrogen's a base, so what should happen? It should you should actually protonate it, and you should end with actually the fully protonated state. Okay. That's the nitrogen gray area. If you're under acidic conditions, you should protonate it and hope for the best. Okay. Sometimes that's shown correctly, sometimes that's not. Okay. Does that make sense? Which kind of gets to Milana's point. We weren't doing nucleophilic addition right away, but we then ended up doing it. Okay. And in the process of doing that nucleophilic addition, how many did we end up doing? We did one two, three, and we finally ended in our final structure. Make sense? Everybody see it? Okay. There's no way I'm gonna be able to draw everything up on one screen, so I wanna make sure we're good before we clean everything. Are we clear? You're still pointing. Are we good? Yeah? Okay. So there was five. What do you want now? Four, four, four. Okay, I heard four. Four, we had one brave volunteer on our far board over here, which was pretty fantastic. Noted right away that we have KOH, and KOH is a strong base. Okay. Noted the hydrogen is acidic. Is a nitrogen hydrogen typically acidic? No. Why is it acidic now? There's resonance stabilization. Okay, so that was a fantastic first step. Deprotonated, you now have a negative nitrogen. What's special about a negative nitrogen? Not terribly stable. It's not stable, and so it can act as a nucleophile. A nucleophile and attack. Let's say you didn't know what the hydroxide was going to act as right at the first step as a nucleophile or a base. The very next step, 
that halogen compound brings in what? That's bringing in a positive carbon. We have an electrophile. Okay, which means the result of step one must be negative. I have to get a nucleophile. If the hydroxide was acting as a nucleophile with our structure, we wouldn't have gotten that negative charge. Does that make sense? Okay. So that means the hydroxide acting as a base was a fantastic first step, which means right out of the gate, step one is acid base. That's not what we're talking about. That's stupid. Why did we put this up here? Maybe step two. Well, what happened in step two? What kind of reaction is step two? SN2. That's not nucleophile addition elimination. Step three, we add more. What? Okay. Why is adding more base now going to do something different than it did before? What happened to the acidic hydrogen? The acidic hydrogen is no longer there, which means now when I add the base, it can't act as a base. It's going to instead act as a nucleophile. Where is there an electrophile? The carbonyls. Okay. So fantastic. She drew the nucleophile attacking the carbonyl, okay. and she got all the way down to this structure. And then someone rudely said, you're out of time, stop drawing, walk around and look at everybody else's stuff. I apologize for that person. Is that where it should have stopped? No. no. Okay, why not? We have a negative nitrogen, which means that nitrogen is very... Basic. Basic. What functional group do we have down there? Carboxylic acid. So what could happen? We could do an acid-base reaction. Okay? It is very borderline to show intramolecular acid-base reactions. Why is this one kind of okay? Because I said so. No. I said so. It's probably not okay. The intramolecular acid-base reactions typically don't happen because you're forming very small ring structures okay, as a transition state. If we go through and look at this, this nitrogen connected to a carbon, 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 oxygen, hydrogen. The transition state for that is roughly seven or is seven atoms. That as a ring structure isn't horrible. That could potentially happen. And someone's probably studied it and said specifically what happens. Okay. For us, I don't really care. I would accept this for a mechanistic step or showing it happen by two different solvent molecules mediating that proton transfer. Does that make sense? Okay. So if we fix that, this time I'm not going to give you a choice because I'm just going to draw it. Would we now have our final answer? Whoops. Why not? Because you have electrophiles in. Never mind, I changed my answer. Mustafa? It's a bad idea. He's wrong. All right, all right. Who's going to attack the carbonyl carbon on the top one? Okay, remember, the nucleophile was strong enough to attack that carbonyl with resonance with that nitrogen. What does the top carbonyl have? The exact same resonance. So if you're going to attack the bottom one, you have to attack the top one too. So the reaction is going to continue a second time with another hydroxide coming in and attacking that top carbonyl. Okay. What happens? We break the pi bond in a nucleophilic addition. We then reform the pi bond and the nucleophile elimination, and what would we kick out? We kick out the nitrogen. Okay. 
All right, all right I got a little protonation happy. We have a negative nitrogen. That's not particularly happy. So what happens? Steals the hydrogen. It could go from the water. Okay. We could also argue it's darn close to the hydrogen that was already there. Okay. So where we get that hydrogen, whoops. Where we get that hydrogen isn't a huge deal, again, in my opinion. But we do need to pick up another hydrogen for that nitrogen. And we would end with that. Okay. Everybody good? So we end up doing some acid base, some substitution, and then two nucleophile addition elimination reactions to end with those two purple products. One of those is your product. I'm not saying the other one isn't a product, but I don't care about the other one. Which of those two is the product? I heard a suggestion for the left. Why left? Who's Taha? I see the right one. And why? Because the product shouldn't have charges. Product shouldn't have charges, but we could follow that up with an acid workup and place those hydrogens on there. So I don't fully accept that as an answer. Those are carbonyls. We could have hydroxides attack again. The result of those you should be able to show is the exact same. No difference. Does anyone want to venture out for an explanation for the leftmost structure? Because you eliminated something from that structure. Because we eliminated something from the structure. All right, that's a possibility. What were you trying to synthesize is always a good question to ask. What was the target? What is the point of doing all of that chemistry? Okay. And that's where this becomes challenging. The point is to make this structure. Isn't nitrogen a nucleophile? Couldn't I have just added NH3 to the alkyl halide? Right out of the gate. What do you got, Liam? I'm thinking no, because it's still attached to two different carbons in the middle of the ring. Not that one. We're talking about doing this reaction. Oh. Sorry, and I think I'm now standing in front of you. Okay. Couldn't I have just done that? Honestly, take a second to think about it a little bit. I'll rub some salt in the wound in a second. What do you got, David? Uh, no, you cannot do that. Okay, so David's going out on a limb and actually saying no, that that reaction is false. Yeah, I go with him because you don't have a polar pack one right Are we doing an addition in this case? We're just doing a substitution. So we don't need to worry about the polar pi bond. So the argument would be, why go through all of this chemistry with the polar pi bond, nucleophile addition, elimination, all that fun stuff, when I could have just done a substitution out of the gate? We talked about this reaction in black. Nitrogen as a nucleophile is very nucleophilic. When I do this one substitution, what do I end with? A nitrogen that is nucleophilic, and arguably more so because carbon has more electrons than hydrogen, which means this nitrogen can now do what? React again. And again. And again. So this reaction in black, the substitution, ends up with primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary amines. I get four products. Right? That sucks to be able to resolve and separate those away from each other. So if all I want to do is form the primary amine, kind of dead in the water with the standard substitution. And that was the conclusion we drew 
chapter 10. Okay. Nitrogen was a horrible nucleophile. Don't use it. What happened here? What did I end with? A primary amine. I've now added a single nitrogen to the structure. And I add it without having to worry about the secondary, tertiary, or quaternary amines. I get one product. This reaction makes primary amines. That's why we use it. Okay? So very insightful on the amount of products. So if you're just taking basically a alkyl halide or whatever halide structure and then subjecting it to this just in order to get the amine off. Just in order to get the amine on. Oh, yeah, so are. if we take a look, the whole point is to get that nitrogen to attack with that carbon and that's it. Why do I need the rest of the structure? To stabilize that nitrogen. To prevent the nitrogen from attacking twice or three times. It can now only react once because the other lone pair on the nitrogen is tied up in resonance. Okay? It's not available for nucleophilic attack. That's pretty neat, or at least I think it is. Probably green chemistry isn't going to like this. Okay, why not? All I wanted to do was add a single atom, and at the same time, what did I produce as waste? A lot. Okay, what do we have? 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I probably didn't count right. But 12 fairly large atoms as just waste, because that's now trash. I don't care about that. I actually just want to get rid of that. Okay? So green-wise, it's a horrible reaction because you're producing a lot of waste. But it is very specific to get me only one amine. Okay? So if we were a green chemist weighing this back and forth, if I need a nitrogen on the structure, I may have to do a reaction that produces lots of waste, but it produces me the product. Whereas the other method doesn't get me as much waste, but it doesn't give me the product either. Okay? So it's... We have to weigh all of those extra steps in there. It's not just the structures. Make sense? Yeah. What I was saying, or what I was asking, is that basically whatever you want to make a primary amine on, you just you get that, and that's two plus a bromine or another ally. So that yeah. That shape isn't particularly special. It's like if I want. Nope. The on yeah, the blue thing space. that I circled, completely unspecial. It's any alkyl halide. And in particular, I think it's typically primary alkyl halides. I think it has to be, because you're looking at a really nasty looking, sterically hindered structure, yeah. okay? And that's what's acting as a nucleophile in that second step that she drew so nicely over there. Okay? Kind of make sense? We're doing a whole bunch of chemistry to do one thing that we thought was impossible, which means? It gets a name. It gets a name, it's a Gabriel synthesis. Right? I don't know why I, that just resonates with me, but like, th th it's kind of like a wing, right? Yeah. Like an angel wing for Gabriel. <laughs> I I. I love it. I love it. I don't know, but it sticks in my head now. Okay, questions about that one? Okay. And I do want to point out that if we look at those two questions that we've gone through, you guys did a really good job. You're not perfect, but you shouldn't be perfect. You literally have not talked about this. Okay? You're attempting to work through something that you've never seen before. Getting anywhere remotely close to what you guys have done is phenomenal. Just want to point that out. So which one now? Two. Two, okay? And I'll, I'll push the phenomenal aspect a step further here because you very quickly pointed out that this is an inherently flawed question with a nucleophilic addition elimination because we have a 1,4 conjugated pi bond mm -hmm. with not a strong nucleophile, which would mean that nitrogen should theoretically do a 1,4 addition, not the direct addition that we need for a nucleophile addition elimination. 
right? So hats off on that. That was a really good insight. Uh, question on that one. Mm -hmm. The one for addition gets that one because it's reversible, correct? Yes. So you can still, because you've got the equilibrium, you can still actually do both? Is that what's allowing us to do So, right and now? this is where this one's going to become challenging, is you've got a lot of possibilities here. All of them have some pretty equal weight, which would mean the amount of products coming out of that reaction is really high, which means it's a, bad it's a really bad reaction to run synthetically. You're getting way too many products with high probabilities. That's going to be an awful product yield. Should I ask? No. Okay, just checking. So let, let's ignore the 1 4 addition for the moment. And let's think about our nucleophilic addition. Where should that nitrogen attack? Because there's two electrophilic sites, those two carbonyls. Are they the same? Okay, so left and right, no. Okay, so what do you think? Take a shot thinking about it first. <laughs> What do you got, David? Right. Why should it attack the right one, not the left one? Because the, uh, if it attacks the, when it tries to attack the left one, if you do the resonance, it's conjugated, that carbon's actually not that positive. That pi bond can do resonance in, meaning that that carbonyl becomes less electrophilic. The rightmost carbon is the more likely one to attack. So, whoops. We nucleophilically add, we it's an eraser. Break the pi bond. Then what do we do? Reform the pi bond. But in the process of reforming the pi bond, we're now going to have to kick out a leaving group. And this is on the back wall. What's our leaving group? That oxygen. Okay. Um... I'll go ahead and draw the intermediate first, just for record. Okay. If we had those electrons come back down, where's our best leaving group? Nitrogen or oxygen? Nitrogen because it's positively charged. It wants those electrons. Okay, so is the oxygen going to be the better leaving group? No. What would need to happen first? You would need to do an acid-base reaction to deprotonate that nitrogen before we reformed the carbonyl, making that NH2 or 5NH, depending on what I've erased or what you saw. Now the electrons come back down, kick out our leaving group. We'd have our O minus. We have our carbonyl on the other half, NH2. Okay. Everybody see it? Okay. Nucleophilically, we added the nitrogen to our carbonyl. Okay. We then ejected a leaving group here. What do you guys think? Questions about it? This is what they showed on the back, so we'll go ahead and accept that. There's another suggestion. Never mind, that's a different question. Uh, any other questions about that one? Okay. Let's go ahead and look at the last one. At the bottom, where's our reactive thing? The two carbonyls. Okay. So we've got a suggestion for the two carbonyls being our reactive site. Does anybody want to challenge that? I would. I would argue BR minus is more important to look at because it's charged. It's charged. Okay. There's a source of chemistry. Okay. You may make the argument that bromide is large and therefore stable. Hold your thought. Okay, so our bromide will come in, attack the carbonyl. Does it matter which carbonyl? No, no they're identical. 
So we'll break the pi bond, we'll form that tetrahedral intermediate, we'll reform the pi bond, we will kick out a leaving group. Nope, I want to form the tetrahedral intermediate, sorry. Okay. Reform the pi bond and we kick out a leaving group. What leaving group do we kick out? If you kick out bromine, what happens? You go backwards. Oh, look, it is an equilibrium. Okay, so you might say, well, that's just taking me backwards. Let's see what would happen if we kicked out the other one. What would we get? I'm going to erase that three in a second if that's bothering you. Yeah? Kind of similar to how we've done everything else. Okay, and one of the questions that came up was, well, why would you kick out bromine versus the oxygen? Okay, well, here's the oxygen. There's the bromide, right? So everything's already drawn up there. Which one do you think was more likely? Which one should I have kicked out, the bromide or the oxygen? Bromide, why? Or are you going to answer something else? Okay, why do you think the oxygen is the most likely to get kicked out? Because it's not as negative as the bromine is going to be. Okay, why? Because it's got a resonance system, and so each of those oxygens is actually only one half. Okay. So the argument that David's making is the oxygen should get kicked out, not the bromide, because it has resonance. Charge, size, electronegativity, resonance. Which one encounters first? Size. Size. Is bromide different in size than oxygen? Yes. What does that mean? It's larger. What does that mean? The bromide is more stable. The bromide is the better leaving group. In this case, we've got the rules to go through and explain it. It follows the pattern that we've seen time and time again. The equilibrium heavily favors the reactants. Okay, so cool. Okay, so what we just overviewed was pretty much all of the reactions across chapters 20 and 21. Right, we just looked at each of those pieces. Okay. What we'll end up doing is now reviewing each of those reactions and now kind of looking at some of their nuanced details. But we've addressed a lot of those nuanced details already today. And you've shown that you can see those connections in those pieces. Right. You just need the practice to help polish that up and really clean that up so that exam three becomes that much more awesome. Make sense? I think that's really cool. I do. Okay. Um, before we get entirely out of here, we're adding more nomenclature. Acids and esters now officially get dropped in on this. We will see acyl chlorides and amides. Um, but naming them is kind of borderline, not very likely to show up anywhere useful, so I don't add them to my list, okay? But you can reference Cardi for those. But our acids are at the very top of our list as far as nomenclature rules, esters just underneath it, okay? So you will see those names typically pop up. Uh, I would recommend you take a look at the practice nomenclature questions, um, but we'll pick up with those. Today is just Monday. Wow. We'll pick up with those in two days on Wednesday. Okay. Good job today, guys.